ये सब कर रहा है आप भी सुपोर्ट कौन 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 ओके अभी की डेट साल है हां ओके Uh, I will handle it. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. No, I mean, thank you. I should go co-edited. But um, um, 
Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the session called uh, Hardware Security. Um, we have four papers in, in the session, and actually we have all kinds of presentations. We have uh, in-person presentation, we have online presentation, we have also video presentation. Good, and the first paper is called Can't Touch This, um, Inertial HSMs Toward Advanced Physical Attacks, and the talk is given by Jan Sebastian Gotter. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Jan. Um, I'm presenting the work of me and uh, Björn Schaumann on what we call inertial HSMs, which is a novel concept of building easy to build, cheap, uh, high security hardware security modules. So what is a hardware security module? Um, it is basically a computer that constantly monitors itself for physical attacks and that destroys or makes unusable the data contained within when it is tampered. Um, this is like kind of my definition, but like we contrast HSMs to smart cards and that an HSM is powered on at all times, at least most designs are, and that it actively monitors for tampering. Um, usually commercial HSMs at least use so-called tamper sensing membranes, which are meshes, which is a very fine uh, plastic foil patterned with like a squiggly trace that is continuously monitored for like interruptions, short circuits, capacitance, uh, resistance or other factors. Um, HSMs, in contrast to smart cards, protect macroscopic circuits. So they usually protect like a circuit board with several chips instead of just like a single die of a chip. Um, and also often they contain multiple tamper sensors, just like smart cards, for example, also temperature sensors, light sensors and others. Um, why would you want one? Well, basically, I see them as a kind of a stopgap measure that allows us to do things uh, in practice that we cannot yet do efficiently with like cryptographic techniques such as secure multiparty computation and others. Um, traditional HSMs usually offer some proprietary API offering like key management functions, encryption, decryption, key generation. Um, custom software is rarely run inside the HSM itself. So usually it's like part of a larger application running outside that talks it through the API. Um, so you don't usually offload like an entire application into the HSM. Um, the history of them is like the first references I could find of the concept are like from some NSA documents from the like Second World War era. Um, they went into like fairly widespread military use in the following years um, and finally arrived like in commercial uses in the 1980s, 1990s sometime um, in like banking applications for protecting semantic uh, keys. And our goal is that today maybe they'll, they will finally arrive widespread in uh, research labs. So this is like one of these early HSMs. Uh, this is like US American one, which is literally just like a special purpose encryption machine inside of a safe, right? That has some temper sensing features. Um, the state of the art in commercial HSMs uh, looks kind of like this. So what you have is like a circuit board with a couple of, uh, with like a processor and some memory on it that is protected inside uh, one of these security meshes. Um, they usually have, usually have like structure sizes in the hundreds of micrometers. So the target is that they should detect like drilling of like fine drill bits, but they cannot uh, like sense smaller intrusions than that usually. Um, commercial agents use, uh, use these security meshes almost ex exclusively as far as I know. Um, but in research, it's uh, like the state of the art is a little bit further already. Like in research, um, designs go beyond these simple meshes. Um, but in our opinion, there is still a lack of designs at like a sweet spot between manufacturer manufacturability and sensitivity. So for example, on one end of the scale, you have the uh, work by Tobias Adal um, that uses radio, uh, radio frequency measurements to scope out like the inside of a conductive enclosure. Um, they're easy to manufacture in mass even. Um, but they're not very sensitive as far as I, uh, as I understand it. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the harder to replicate but very sensitive uh, work by uh, Inlight Al. Um, earlier today, there was in the Puffs uh, session a presentation on this, um, which is very sensitive, but of course it's harder to manufacture because it requires like a, a fine special purpose uh, security mesh membrane that requires specialized production processes. And also it requires uh, like very complex analog circuitry to read that mesh. Our work is kind of in between of these. It's, uh, we hope uh, at, at once easy to replicate um, with like low resources, but also sensitive enough to provide like a practical security guarantee, even in sensitive applications. Um, commercially available HSMs, I promise this is the only hot take for this presentation. Um, in my opinion, show like kind of a uh, example of technological stagnation due to like a lack of competition. Since these designs are usually kind of siloed inside of, an, of a single country 
because they're used for like military or police security applications, um, there doesn't seem to be like much competition. It's usually like three vendors maybe. Um, the disadvantages are they have fairly low processing speed, which is also limited by power dissipation because all the power has to be dissipated through heat conduction through the membrane. Um, they do not usually offer bare metal access to the processing hardware. And also from a research point of view, uh, the requirement to sign an NDA to get access to them, as well as the extremely high cost at like 20,000 euros a unit, uh, kind of limits what you can do with them in a research context. Um, so our idea was, well, if we can't buy it, we'll just make your own. Um, the difficult part, in our opinion, to uh, DIYing, like, building your own hardware security module is the security barrier. Um, basically to prevent attacks by probing or bridging traces, um, you need very fine features. Um, so like very fine traces, fine not for like semiconductor process scales, but like for, for example, printed circuit board manufacturing uh, scales. Uh, to prevent is it disassembly, the parts must be engineered to be fragile. So the idea is that if somebody tries to manipulate the HSM in any way, it's supposed to break as much as possible, so you can easily sense the intrusion. Um, the obvious choice of using a commercial printed circuit board manufacturing processes for the security mesh um, in our opinion, it doesn't really work because these commercial printed circuit boards are usually made to be robust. So they're like fairly easy to modify after the fact by like scratching off solder resist and like bridging traces with copper wires under the microscope, which is kind of the opposite of what you need. So our uh, idea is what we call the inertial hardware security module. The idea, the, the core observation is that you can't tamper what you can't touch, right? Um, excluding like some very specialty techniques. Um, so to create a secure tamper barrier from cheap off the shelf printed circuit boards, what we did is we first create an insecure barrier from them. Um, so we just pattern these circuit boards with like mesh traces and then to avoid or to prevent an attacker from tampering with these mesh traces, what we do is we take this cage, we build out, these, out of these circuit boards and we spin it really fast. Really fast means about a thousand RPM. Um, so that you cannot, cannot easily like rotate yourself along with the device without like incurring serious damage. Um, we can tell if somebody stops spinning our security mesh by putting an accelerometer on it. Um, and we like the main points you could imagine against a design like this is probably like longevity, uh, power consumption, but it turns out this is not really a problem um, compared to like a PC case fan, which has about the same rotation speed of a thousand RPM and which runs from like a couple hundred milliwatts or even a watt. And this thing also pushes air at the same time. So like we don't need to push air, so we need less energy, uh, less power, and uh, they run for years at a time with no issues. Um, the key components of an inertial hardware security module, you see like a mock-up of our prototype on the right side of the slide. The key components are like the low-tech security mesh made from PCBs, um, an accelerometer that is placed on the rotating security mesh. Um, you need a rotating power and data coupling for like transferring, like for powering the rotating security mesh and for communicating between the stationary static payload system and the rotating security mesh. Um, and you need a motion subsystem, which is basically a motor with an adjustable digitally controlled motor controller. Um, the first issue we tackled in creating a prototype for one of these is the mesh generation. We developed an open source workflow to use the KiCad electronics ADA package to create these security mesh PCBs, such as the one you see here on the uh, slide, um, for like arbitrary shapes. Um, what we do is we take the input shape of our circuit board, including holes or any other features, we overlay it with a grid of cells, um, we then filter out all these cells that are like inside, like completely contained within the shape. Um, we then do from a start, uh, manually located starting point, we do like a, uh, we cover the uh, entire grid with a tree. Uh, search and then we lay a tr like two two or more traces of the uh, of the circuit along the outside of this tree search as is illustrated in this picture. In practice, and optimization we are using here is that we observe that there's only 15 possible combinations on how the cells in this grid can be connected to the neighbors. So we can simply do this very efficiently with a lookup table. Uh, the thing runs even within this keycard automation system within a couple of seconds. Um, this is what the meshes look like. Um, for the tree search, this shows like increasing randomness factors, which means in, on the left, for every cell, we take a deterministic next cell. 
if available. And on the right for every cell, we randomize all the possible uh, uh, cells that we can continue walking into uh, with a uniformly dis uh, distribution. So as you can see, like, well, yeah, we, we are able to like cover arbitrary shapes with this. And it also doesn't like obviously include like any repeatable patterns visible to a human eye of uh, somebody trying to reverse engineer one. Um, the second issue we had to tackle is um, with the mesh done, the second temper sensor we need is the accelerometer. Um, the issue we had to tackle with that is the question whether it's sensitive enough and whether the, there is, uh, it is resilient enough against env environmental noise. So we use an off-the-shelf automotive accelerometer. Um, because at 1000 RPM, we very quickly at very low radius already get extremely la large accelerations of like 100 Gs. So um, we found that this, uh, these automotive parts have the required range and have sufficient precision. The external influences such as shocks or vibration due to nearby machinery or earthquakes even are like orders of magnitude smaller than our signal. On the right, you see like a couple of traces that we took at different accelerate, uh, the different rotation speeds with our accelerometer. And so um, we get a very clean signal out of that. Um, all accelerometers produce, uh, have a constant drift and they only produce relative measurements. Um, so we have to like occasionally change the rotation speed in a practical application or to recalibrate the accelerometer on the fly. Um, finally, the issue of power and data transfer remains. Um, now, we considered a couple of options. Mechanical slip rings don't really work because they don't work at the high speeds for long durations. Um, we considered having a special motor wound that includes a second transformer coil as part of the construction. Um, we decided against that because we do want our design to be easily replicated by any research lab without needing to talk to manufacturers to have like specialty components made. We settled on a purely optical system that for the data link uses photodiode and, photo uh, and, and LEDs. So um, in the latest uh, revision of the design, we simply use like a red LED for the TX line and a blue LED for the RX line of the UART. And then we talk some very simple noise-based protocol with like some authentication and encryption over that through a standard UART between like our payload and our rotating mesh monitoring microcontroller. The disadvantage is it's slightly mechanically complex, but it can build 100% from cheap commercially available components. Um, now, an issue with our initial design uh, is that it has a weak point at the axis of rotation where the axis penetrates the security mesh. Um, we accepted that vulnerability for the initial proof of concept. Um, the defense mechanisms, are that, like there's a bunch of defenses you can do against that. You can either have more than one axis of rotation, you can have the axis of rotation precess as well. Um, or what I sh have shown here, what's also in the paper, is you can have like a second independent security mesh on the inside that, while not theoretically mitigating this vulnerability, at least makes it extremely annoying to fit some sort of probe into the device without breaking any of the meshes and without affecting like any of the rotation of any of the uh, meshes. Um, also, you would include in a in one of these HSMs, like in any other hardware security module, additional temper sensing through uh, things like light or radiation or temperature sensors. Um, but also, since we have accelerometers and digital motor control, we can use the we can monitor motor current and vibration as well for tempering. Um, this is pictures of the uh, PCB component, like circuit board components of our initial design. On the left, you see the actual security mesh cage. So the entire outside of this thing is covered by the security mesh. As you can see, we do not need a full cylinder or every, anything because we are rotating the thing. We can have like these vertical struts for the same effect. Um, this means this design, for example, allows for air cooling of the payload, which allows for like much higher power dissipation than with traditional designs. The part on the right in this picture is just a mount for in our prototype a Raspberry Pi single board computer as just a stand in for the actual payload system. Um, this is what the fully assembled prototype looks like. Um, so you see in the middle the uh, mount for the Raspberry Pi with also the motor controller on it, and then like the security mesh positioned on a concentric axis around it. Um, in this picture, it's missing these vertical struts that you saw in the last picture, simply because the motor controller is inside and it needed like a manual knob to turn to turn it on, and I didn't want to like uh, break my fingers uh, trying to access it. Um, yeah, so. Uh, our idea, our mission with this project is to enable research into hardware security modules more widespread by making these things open source accessible to anyone with a an basic electronics lab without specialty components, without special manufacturing processes, uh, and to enable a bunch of new applications, for example, with custom hardware inside the hardware security module or with new applications running entirely within the HSM because we now have like general purpose commodity processing hardware as the payload. 
Um, this is something we're currently working on, which is we want to scale up the design to allow for full micro ATX server main boards inside of the security envelope, which will allow like new applications because now we can do like an entire application inside the security envelope, whereas previously you would have to split it along some API boundary into the secure and non-secure part. Um, yeah, the designs are all open source from CAD designs to code and available at the Git URL over there. Um, and I'm open for your questions. A bit fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there is a question there. Um, there's another one here. Okay. Yeah, we have to like run around a bit yes. with the microphone because we only have one for this room. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Interesting idea. Um, so what are the attacks you claim you protect against? So I guess I missed it. Okay, so like the, uh, we basically have the same attacker model as a traditional HSM. So we assume that an attacker wants to, for example, uh, probe circuit traces inside of the HSM. We don't even consider like attacks at the chip level. We assume, for example, that inside the HSM, there might be a chip running firmware that is next to memory where you could even probe the traces and gain some information that way. So what we want is we basically want to have the security envelope of like a couple centimeters in diameter and keep any attacker manipulation outside of that physical space. But so in usually in HSM, as I understand it, you also protect against fault attacks, right? Traditional HSMs protect against that in that um, they also simply put like a physical distance between the nearest you can get to the application chips. And they do have filtering on the power input to the device, which we would also need in our design if we were to like build it out into like a full practical implementation. But you can fault it by laser because you have an optical data transfer, right? Uh, yeah, well, you could definitely fault the, op like the, in, in this uh, uh, in this draft, you could definitely fault the optical, like, uh, communications link between the mesh microcontroller and the payload. What we did against that is a bit more described in the paper. We simply used like a uh, cryptographically authenticated uh, and encrypted uh, channel over the UART, um, where on first spin up, when the device gets commissioned, it uses an ephemeral key, which it then memorizes. So you could inject data into that, but then that would quickly be caught by like a heartbeat signal sent over that link. Okay, thank you. My question is, uh, what happens if uh, attacker builds the system that rotates around so the, the, yeah. with, with the same angle speed? Uh? Yeah, that is the one thing you could definitely do to attack the system. Um, I think the reasoning of it is that we increase the effort you need for an attack by like orders of magnitude because at a thousand RPM to build a, like at a thousand RPM at a distance of, at a radius of 10 centimeters, you already have more than a hundred G of centrifugal acceleration. So to build a robot that is able to do like a targeted, like, I don't know, solder a wire to a security mesh at a thousand RPM, in our opinion, is not really feasible from an engineering point of view. And if it becomes feasible at some point, we can bump it up to 2000 RPM, which like increases the uh, centrifugal acceleration by a factor of four. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other question? Uh, I just want to ask about your threat model. Do you consider the chip that inside the module, it is trusted or untrusted? Sorry, I did, did not understand. I mean, you think that the chip inside the uh, module, is it trusted? Okay, so the payload of the module um, is basically anything the user wants it to be. Um, you would, uh, with what, by employing this technology, what you do is from the point where you commission it, where you spin it up um, onwards, you have a certain assurance that nobody is going to be able to tamper with the payload. So, for example, you could put like a the Raspberry Pi single board computer inside there. And then like once you have commissioned it, even if you put it in untrusted locations, such as the data center, you would have a certain assurance that nobody will be able to like tamper with that payload system. Uh, so did you also evaluate for the uh, higher frequency radiations? I mean, the terahertz or something like this? Yeah, so the um, you have to consider two things there. The payload itself has to be protected by electromagnetic shielding also you have to mechanically shield it because if you have like our prototype design has like these gaps in the security envelope a synchronized pulsed laser might also be able to do something to the payload so you have to shield against that but it should be fairly easy because you just need like a centimeter of aluminum to make it really annoying to do anything to the payload within 
Um, the other thing that we have to trust is like a piece of the, the microcontroller that is monitoring the mesh that is sitting on the mesh. There basically we have to assure that with a like non-contact attack using some laser or something, it is not possible to like modify that microcontroller in a targeted way to cause it to stop monitoring the mesh, for example. But we think that is a reasonable assumption given like the current state of uh, the art in engineering. Okay. Thank you. There was another question here, but uh, we run a lot of time. If, if it's okay to leave it for the for the break for the coffee break, okay. Thank you so much thank for you very the talk. Much. Let's uh, thank Jan again. Okay, the next talk will be completely online. Um, you can share your screen, Mario, Mario, or Marius. I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, Marius, yeah. Okay, we see your face. Uh, I think your screen is also coming. Do you hear us, right? Yes, I can hear you well. Good. Um, yes, we see your screen. I don't know whether it's full screen or no, whether you can make it better, but if it's uh, the maximum thing that you can do, you are on the stage. Um, I need to change something on the screen. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I think this is the best I can do. I don't know if. Yeah. Good. There's a little um, bit on the top. Are you ready, Mario? Mario? Yes. Good. Yeah, the talk or the paper is called Towards um, a Formal Treatment of Logic Locking. And uh, Mario Georgio is giving the talk. Mario, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, this is a. Um, um, this is a talk about uh, logic locking, and it's a joint work with uh, Pierre Luigi Nuzzo and Peter Birel from the University of Southern California, and Alex Malozemov and Ben Hamlin from uh, Galois. All right, so um, let's start with the motivation of logic locking. So let's say um, there is a designer that comes up uh, with a with a new chip that does something. Uh, uh, something new, for example, it performs uh, a new fast algorithm or some uh, machine learning model um, or something proprietary in general, and it would like to print uh, this chip. And, and today, it's, um, it's, it's usually uh, cheaper to basically delegate the manufacturing of the chip um, to, to another manufacturer where we basically send the description uh, of the chip, the manufacturer prints the chip, and sends it back to the uh, to the designer. All right. So, um, however, what happens if if uh, the the manufacturer the 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 fab is actually malicious, right? In this case, uh, they can do a lot of um, a, a number of different things. It could uh, uh, try to uh, overproduce this chip for its own benefit. It could try to um, extract. Uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit. Uh, I can try to. Talk a little bit louder. I don't know if you, if this is better. Um, all right. Yeah. So uh, it can try to overproduce for its own benefit, or it can try to extract some intellectual property. For example, yeah, this is uh, an improved algorithm or a, um, uh, this machine learning model. Uh, it can try to extract sensitive data that is hardwired on the chip, or um, or maybe some secret keys that are also hardwired in this chip. Um, all right, so the idea uh, behind logic locking is to modify um, uh, this interaction basically with a uh, with a fab. So now the the designer first locks the chip with a with some secret key and then sends this locked version uh, to the fab. And now the fab prints this locked version of the chip and sends it back to the uh, to the designer. And now the the chip is only useful as as long as we provide the correct key to it. Um, all right. So yeah, this is the basic I idea of uh, logic locking. Uh, however, in the past, there have been a lot of um, um, uh, pitfalls and uh, cryptography issues. So for one, there was a there has been a lack of a formal threat model. Uh, for example, um, the, there has been only uh, there, there were only um, a limited set of, um, of of attacks that were considered. For example, only SAT attacks. Uh, and in general. There were um, implicit or informal assumptions about the threat model. Um, there was also a lack of uh, rigorous security definitions, uh, in the sense that uh, we didn't, um, yeah, um, it wasn't precise 
uh, what the adversary's task is. Is it to, to, uh, to recover the original circuit? Uh, is it to recover a predicate of the circuit? Is it to recover the, uh, the key that we used to lock the circuit? Um, what are the adversary's resources also? Um, is it the description of the chip? Uh, does the adversary have uh, black box access to the chip? Um, things like this. And also, what's the, uh, the, the, the power of the adversary in terms of time and space? Um, and the, uh, it was also confused um, uh, in some cases with a software obfuscation. All right, so what do we do in, um, in this paper? Uh, basically, we try to formalize uh, logic logic. And at its core, we say that logic locking is a procedure or a, a randomized algorithm that takes an input, takes an input uh, as input a circuit C. And what it outputs, it's, it, it outputs is a locked circuit L together with a key. And correctness says that uh, if we evaluate L uh, on, any, on any input using the correct, the correct key, then the output is what we would get uh, if we evaluate it C. Right, so L and C are functionally equivalent uh, as as long as we give the correct key to the um, to the local circuit L. All right, so this is the this is the correctness. Um, but uh, how about security, right? So as we said, there have been um, there have been uh, uh, in the past there there were only specific classes of attacks that were considered. Uh, for example, um, only SAT attacks uh, or structural attacks or removal attacks. Uh, from the circuit, uh, but in practice, adversaries can can do much more than uh, just uh, SAT attacks, right? And so we'd like to follow a more cryptographic approach to this, where uh, we we uh, we basically are become very rigorous about the types of adversaries and the classes of adversaries uh, that we consider. And um, also in the past, um, um, it it was uh, it was at times not clear what a, a what the adversary has access to. Um, or what, has, what are the adversary's objectives? Um, for example, um, is uh, the, the adversary's objective to, to recover the, the whole circuit uh, or an important part of the circuit or uh, yeah, some predicate of the circuit? All right, so the first definition of security that uh, we give is uh, an indistinguishability-based definition, and it goes at, as follows. So we have the adversary and the challenger, which is a kind of... Um, uh, the, a very common uh, approach to approach security in, in cryptography. And so, and so the adversary picks two circuits of his choice, C0 and C1, and sends them to the challenger. And now the challenger locks uh, one of the two at random and sends back the lock the locked circuit back to the adversary. And now the adversary's goal is simply to guess which of the two circuits uh, the challenger locked. And, and we say that the adversary wins if it manages to guess uh, the, the circuit that the challenger picked. Right, and then logic logging, we say that logic logging is in the LL secure if all adversaries win with probability um, at most one half plus something, uh, plus something negligible. All right, um, so yeah, this uh, you can see this uh, resembles a lot uh, in distinguishability also in, in encryption. Okay, so what have we managed to do until now, right? So first, we do not constrain the adversary to any specific uh, attack, right? Uh, second, we consider a very particular, a particularly strong setting. If the adversary knows, uh, basically the adversary knows everything about the two circuits, right? Because he chose them. Uh, but still, it cannot figure out which, uh, which of the two circuits uh, we locked. It also cap captures a lot of other uh, uh, concrete security goals, right? Because um, it uh, we can show that if an, an adversary cannot distinguish it can also not use a sat attack to recover the key for example or it cannot uh, recover the whole circuit or a part of the circuit um and and i won't touch this uh, this topic but it can also be extended to security with leakage or, or side channel attacks all right so um this is indistinguishability def based definitions are nice and they are easy to to work with but uh, um, uh, they are not uh, as intuitive, uh, right? So what we would like to do is to uh, try to give a more intuitive definition using simulators. Uh, and the idea is to basically imagine an entity that uh, we usually call a simulator that do does not have access at all to the locked circuit L. And now if we can show that um, an adversary with access to the locked circuit 
cannot learn any more information than the, uh, the simulator who does not have access to the uh, to the lock circuit, then the scheme is secure, right? Because because the simulator um, basically does not even have access to the lock circuit, so uh, it cannot get any information out of it. All right. So how would we formalize uh, simulation security? So we have the adversary on the left that takes uh, as input L as well as Oracle, Oracle access to the, to the original circuit C. And at the end, it outputs a bit B. Uh, this, B can be, this bit can be some predicate of the, of the circuit. For example, whether the first gate of the circuit is an end gate or, or it is not an end gate. And now the simulator uh, on the right takes no input at all, right? So it doesn't take L. And it's given again access, Oracle access to the circuit. And it is allowed also to have black box, black box access to the adversary, right? So it can come up with some uh, uh, circuit L of its choice and give it to the adversary. And then it can also receive queries from the adversary and give, get, give back uh, answers to the adversary. All right, and we say that the, the scheme is CMLL secure if basically B and B prime have almost the same uh, distributions. Okay, and now I would like to show you some uh, implications between these uh, these definitions. So the first one is that uh, indel implies simlL, and uh, the proof sketch goes as follows. Basically, we want to define a simulator that kind of simulates the adversary, right? So the way it works is basically by first picking a random, uh, an arbitrary circuit C prime, and locking this C prime so it gets an L prime back. And then it initializes the adversary with this L prime. And now the adversary, uh, whenever the adversary queries, makes a query, then the simulator takes this query and forwards it to its own oracle and get, gives back to the adversary the result of the oracle. All right, and we can basically see kind of intuitively that um, uh, this, the, this simulator is, is working uh, well. Why? Because L, um, L and N prime are indistinguishable from the point of view of the adversary, right? So the adversary behaves uh, the same way, no matter whether it's given L or L prime. Uh, the second, the second proof that I would like, the second theorem that I would like to show you is that the CMLL does not imply in the L. And now the proof uh, goes as follows: We would like to uh, to take a, a scheme that is CMLL. And transform it into another scheme that is that remains CMLL but is not in the LL anymore. All right, and how do we do this? So basically, uh, we create this lock prime. That what it does is it first locks the circuit using lock, and then it attaches to this uh, lock circuit um, uh, say the the value of the circuit evaluated on uh, on a fixed value, let's say zero. And now this is the new circuit, L prime. Um, and this is, yeah, this is basically the locked, uh, the locked circuit. And we can show that um, these two claims hold. So the first claim is that lock prime remains CMLL. And the idea here is that C, even, even though the simulator is not given L prime, right? So it doesn't really know C0, C of zero, it does have Oracle access to C. So it can retrieve C0. Um, by itself. On the other hand, um, lock prime is not in the LL anymore. And the reason is that now an adversary that plays the indistinguishability game can pick two circuits, C0 and C1, that differ on zero. And so by getting back L prime, it can easily tell which of the two circuits we, we locked. Now, um, yeah, I, another definition that I'd like to show you uh, is, uh, is that of functional secrecy that it has been implicit uh, among uh, several previous works. And uh, this definition is very similar to simulation-based definition that we, saw, that we showed earlier, uh, with the difference that the adversary now has to guess the whole circuit. Uh, and the simulator have, has to guess the whole circuit as well, right? So the adversary uh, outputs the circuit uh, C adversary, and the simulator outputs the circuit C simulator. And we say that the logic logic scheme is uh, FS secure if the probability that the adversary guesses correctly guesses correctly is 
is almost the same as the probability that the simulator guesses correctly um, this circuit. And we can show that the CMLL actually implies uh, functional secrecy. Uh, another definition that was proposed last year by uh, Chotar and Shrimpton uh, basically considers uh, logic logging only for unlearnable circuits. So what are unlearnable circuits? Basically, they are it's, it's a class of circuits uh, where if we pick a random circuit from this class and we give Oracle access to the adversary uh, to that circuit, then the adversary cannot really guess which circuit we picked out of this class, right? So we say that this class uh, calligraphic C is unlearnable if the, the best adversary can, can guess the circuit with probability almost one over the size of C, right? Um, because we can always guess, uh, we can always make a random guess and get a, a winning probability of uh, one over C or one of the, over the size of C. You can think of unlearnable functions as, uh, for example, point functions. Uh, this is a class of unlearnable, unlearnable uh, functions. Uh, and now function recovery is defined basically uh, by having the challenger also send the locked uh, version of this random circuit picked from the, from the class, right? So the adversary is tasked in the same again to guess, to guess the, the circuit that we, we picked, but uh, it's also given now the locked uh, circuit. All right. And now we can show that the uh, functional secrecy implies functional recovery. So remi I remind you that functional secrecy is a simulation-based definition where the, the adversary and the simulator output their guesses of, of, the, of the circuit. Uh, and how does the proof go? Basically, um, uh, suppose we have an adversary against FR, then this adversary is also an adversary against uh, functional secrecy. And we know by functional secrecy that there is a simulator that can guess the circuit even without given, given L, right? But this simulator is actually a learner for this, uh, for this class. So we end up, so we basically prove by contradiction that, um, yeah, we basi this basically implies that C is learnable, right? Which, uh, which bring a, brings us to contradiction. And we show uh, more relations. Um, between um, yeah, we, we define some more uh, definitions, and then we saw some more relations between uh, these definitions. Uh, one last thing I would like to show you is um, is how to build a logic locking, secure logic locking using universal circuits. And uh, I remind you that universal circuits are circuits that can basically evaluate any other circuits, any other circuit of size n. So if you if uh, if we give a circuit uh, C together with an input X to a universal circuit, then this evaluates to C of X. All right, and how do we build the Intel L security using universal circuits? Well, the, the construction is st straightforward. So we set L to be the universal circuit and we set K to be uh, the circuit we want to lock, right? And now it's easy to show correctness and in fact, we even get perfect, uh, perfect, perfect indistinguishability, right? Uh, why? Because uh, no matter whether we lock C0 or C1, right, we always get the same L, the universal circuit. Um, and so there is no way to tell, uh, by looking at the universal circuit, there is no way to tell which of the two circuits uh, we locked. Um, all right, so, so, uh, some open problems, and this is my last slide. Uh, yeah, so we can use universal circuits to get perfect security, right? So a, que a reasonable question is, can we trade perfect security for more efficient constructions? Because universal circuits uh, have size at least n log n. For, uh, for n if, if we want to evaluate circuits of size n, a universal circuit has to have size at least n log n. So the idea would be to have a pseudo universal circuit that can evaluate only a, a small a small number of circuits, but still the adversary cannot tell which circuits it uh, it can evaluate. Um, and the current work focuses only on computation uh, combinational circuits. And some interesting next steps is to develop definitions uh, for latch locking, as well as um, definitions for sequential circuits. Uh, yeah, and this uh, 
basically con concludes my talk. Okay, thank you for the talk. Any questions from the audience? I go here, we have a question. Marius, do you hear us? Yes. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I can see your threat model. I mean, it's too generic. Uh, and uh, the question that I have that you presented a proof of concept for the logic locking, but uh, I could not see the security analysis. Uh, I mean, how you can prove that this is, I mean, uh, it's uh, like uh, resistance to the uh, already state of the art, uh, uh, state of the art attacks. Uh, right. So the um, um, the proof is uh, is basically uh, from a cryptographic uh, point of view. So um, basically, the universal circuit doesn't ha doesn't have any information related to the circuit we want to evaluate. Right. So the universal circuit we can evaluate any other circuit of a specific size. Um, and so. And so, by by picking uh, by picking the universal circuit kind of independently of the circuit we want to evaluate, we are sure uh, that um, we get security. Um, not sure if uh, this uh, this is this answers your question. Um, I, I just want to add one remark because the SAT attacks are too powerful attack, and I mean we have to define very carefully the threat model. There are Oracle less and Oracle based technique. And they can break. I mean, it's very smart attack. So for, to prove the our idea, it's very important that we have to provide the security analysis. Otherwise, I mean, it's hard to convince someone. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. We have it. And now we have another question. Wait a second, Mario's. Yeah. Actually, I don't have any question. I just wanted to answer um, your question related to this. The point is that universal circuit does not leak any information possible about the circuit. Therefore, SMT and SAT attacks are infeasible. It is cryptographically uh, proved that it is impossible. Okay, thank you. Any other, yeah, there is another question. <clears throat> yeah, after lunch, I have to run, yeah? <laughs> just trying to imagine it practically what would be the difference between your universal circuit and an FPGA um right so um right so we we believe that FPGA is basically uh, implementing practice this idea of uh, universal circuits and in fact um this uh, um this work by a, a recent work by Masero Vital Masero Garg Mai Pileggi uh, Goyal and Parno uh, that I cite in the bottom of, the, of this slide, uh, in fact, implements the idea of universal circuits uh, on an FPGA. Okay, thank you. Um, just have a, we'll have a look whether we have any questions from online audience. Um, I have at least seen some messages in the chat, um, but here not, right? Okay, no, because there is chat message, okay. Thank you so much. Let's um, thank Marius again. I'm Marcos again. Um, that was too loud. Oh, that was video. Okay, okay. Uh, Marco, you are online, right? Yes, I'm here. Right. Okay. Thanks for your availability. We will play your video now, and then um, you are available for questions. Yes, thank you. We will start not too loud, hopefully. And the good thing is you can see the Mario's face. Antonioli from Eurecom, Eleonora Duzuc and Mauro Conti from the University of Padova, and Mattia Speyer from the EPFL. I'm Marco Casagrande, a PhD from Eurecom, France. This is a joint work with my PhD advisor Daniele Antonioli from Eurecom, Eleonora Duzuc and Mauro Conti from the University of Padova and Mattia Speyer from the EPFL. I will now present Break Me, Reversing, Exploiting and Fixing Xiaomi Fitness Tracking Ecosystem. We studied fitness tracking devices such as wearable smartbands because they are cheap, multipurpose and increasingly popular. 
Smart bands have sensors that calculate steps, calories, sleep, and heart rate. Unprotected access to this sensitive health data will be a critical privacy breach. Fitness trackers also provide many more exploitable features. The attacker could upload a rogue firmware through the over-the-air firmware update process, hijack NFC payments or unlock phones using the tracker. Most fitness trackers communicate over Bluetooth Low Energy, in short, BLE, and can benefit from the security mechanisms put in place by the Bluetooth standard. The duty of a correct implementation falls on the developers, which often ignore or misuse said mechanisms. We wanted to understand how secure fitness tracking ecosystems actually are. We chose Xiaomi as our target because it is a market leader, thanks to its flagship product, the Mi Band. Ours is the first research work to assess the security and privacy of Xiaomi fitness tracking ecosystem, and our findings are demoralizing. Xiaomi designed custom proprietary protocols on top of BLE, re-implementing BLE pairing and session establishment in their own, unsecure way. In our work, we reverse Xiaomi's custom protocols spoken over BLE. We discover that they disregard the BLE standard security mechanisms despite supporting them. Then we identify severe and unknown vulnerabilities in their custom implementation, such as unilateral and repayable authentication. We exploit those vulnerabilities in six automated and low-cost attacks that result in privacy breach and complete control over the BLE traffic. Those attacks affect all trackers released between 2016 and 2021. We open source BreakMe, an extensible toolkit. We fix Xiaomi protocols using state-of-the-art countermeasures such as elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key agreement and BLE link layer encryption. And we disclose our findings to Xiaomi. We also evaluate the Fitbit ecosystem and the charge shoot tracker. You will find more details on the countermeasures and the Fitbit ecosystem in our paper, as I will skip those topics because of time constraints. In the following slides, I will illustrate our system model and give a broad overview of Xiaomi protocols. Then I will explain the attacks and the vulnerabilities they exploit. Finally, I will conclude by describing our setup and the evaluation results. Fitness trackers such as the Mi Band can only communicate over Bluetooth Low Energy, a wireless communication protocol used by low-power devices that follows a client-server architecture. The mobile companion app, the client, connects and communicates with the fitness tracker, the server. Our system model includes three entities, the tracker, the app, and the backend, connected to the app over Wi-Fi. Most traffic happens over BLE, so this will be our main focus. For many devices, the BLE protocol stack is enough. For more complex operations, developers can implement, on top of BLE host and controller layers, their own custom protocols at the application layer. Next, we describe the three Xiaomi custom protocols, pairing, authentication, and communication. We reverse them with a combination of static and dynamic reverse engineering techniques, including the compiling, the obfuscation, dynamic traffic analysis, and dynamic binary instrumentation. Pairing happens the first time the app connects to a new tracker. During pairing, the two entities agree on a secret long-term pairing key, shown as a black key in the figure, that will be used during authentication. We reversed Xiaomi pairing version 1 used by Mi Band 2, 3 and Amazrit Core 2. We also reversed Xiaomi pairing version 2, released in 2019, and used by the Mi Band 4, 5 and 6. The second version is more sophisticated as it requires access to Xiaomi backend. Our attacks work regardless of the pairing version and without knowledge of the existing pairing key. Authentication happens at the beginning of every session, namely whenever the app starts a new connection with a previously paired tracker. The goal of authentication is to prove the possession of the pairing key exchanged during pairing. The app authenticates through a challenge response and gains access to the protected data on the tracker. After authenticating, the app can subscribe to services exposed by the tracker. While subscribed, the app receives periodic updates on the data gathered by the tracker, for example, the heart rate and the steps. We call this the communication protocol. Now I will present the threat model for our four proximity over the air attacks. Then I will explain the attacks, the vulnerabilities they exploit and their impact. In our proximity threat model, the attacker attacks a fitness tracker and the app paired with it. He is within BLE range, easily up to 20 and 30 meters, and targets Xiaomi's pairing authentication and communication protocols by sniffing BLE traffic and by interacting with the tracker and the app with Xiaomi compliant packets. 
the attacker has no physical access and does not tamper with the device's operative system or hardware. He knows publicly available information, such as the tracker's BLE address, a hex identifier, periodically advertised within BLE range. The attacker has no prior knowledge of the shared secrets, such as the pairing key. He has four goals, impersonating the app to the tracker, impersonating the, trap, the tracker to the app, establishing a man-in-the-middle position between them, and eavesdropping the private data exchanged between them. In the proximity eavesdropping attack, the attacker sniffs BLE traffic and reads it. Three novel vulnerabilities make this attack impactful. During pairing version 1, he reads the pairing key sent in clear by the app, our first vulnerability. During pairing version 2, he reads the pairing key seed sent in clear by the tracker, a second vulnerability. It is easy to derive the pairing key from this seed. The attacker inputs the seed and the public BLE address of the tracker in the custom Xiaomi key derivation function we reversed, and obtains the key as the result. In both pairing versions, the attacker retrieves the key and can authenticate later. During communication, the data is exchanged without encryption, despite sharing the pairing key. This serious vulnerability allows the attacker to read the health data of the victim in real time. In the proximity tracker impersonation attack, the attacker targets the authentication protocol, shown in the diagram. The attacker creates a fake tracker with a BLE address that matches the target tracker. The app sees the matching address and connects to it. Then the challenge response begins, using the pairing key as the shared secret. Xiaomi's authentication suffers from the unilateral app authentication vulnerability, as this challenge response only authenticates the app to the tracker. Therefore, an attacker can impersonate any tracker without needing to authenticate, and can submit fake data to the app. In the proximity app impersonation attack, the attacker gains a main the middle position between the tracker and the app, forwarding any message exchanged. In particular, the attacker forwards the challenge to the legitimate app and retrieves the correct response needed to authenticate. The replayable authentication vulnerability is caused by the lack of nonsense. Given a specific challenge, the response from the app will always be the same, leading to replayability. While authenticated, the attacker can access to protected data. The attacker has now a trusted connection with the tracker, so he drops the connection with the app. The proximity man in the middle attack combines the previous tracker impersonation and app impersonation attacks, deploying them at the same time. In this case, the attacker keeps the connection with the legitimate app and has complete control over any BLE traffic. Not only the attacker can read the traffic due to the lack of encryption, but another vulnerability, the lack of integrity protection, allows him to forge packets. Now I will present the threat model for our two remote software-based attacks. Then I will explain the attacks, the vulnerabilities they exploit, and their impact. In our remote threat model, the attacker attacks a fitness tracker and the app paired to it but proximity is not required. He targets a victim with an Android phone. We assume that the attacker is able to install a malicious app on the victim's smartphone, a common assumption for many Android malware studies. The attacker app uses normal permissions except for Android 12 and does not require root privileges. The attacker has no physical access and does not tamper with the device's operative system or hardware, but can connect with the tracker over BLE and with the Xiaomi backend through Wi-Fi. The attacker has no prior knowledge of the shared secrets, such as the pairing key. He targets Xiaomi's pairing authentication and communication protocols and has two goals, impersonating the app to the tracker and is dropping the private data exchanged between them. In the remote eavesdropping attack, the attacker exploits a known Android issue. Since the BLE channel is shared by all apps, any app can read the whole BLE traffic. We combine this issue with the novel Xiaomi vulnerabilities explained in the previous slides. The attacker app can read any BLE packet because of no encryption. In particular, it can intercept the pairing key or the pairing key seed. It can also directly access protected data as the legitimate app authenticates the smartphone to the tracker and our malicious app shares the same connection and does not need to authenticate. 
In the remote app impersonation attack, the attacker exploits a novel trick. We discovered a factory reset BLE command that does not require authentication. The tracker resets, changing BLE address. Since Xiaomi app identifies trackers by their address, it will not recognize the device anymore. Now, the attacker can legitimately pair by reimplementing Xiaomi pairing and by exploiting the weak user confirmation vulnerability. While a user prompt appears on the tracker's display, it does not show enough information. In the figure, we show pairing version 2 that requires additional interaction with Xiaomi backend. We reverse those web API calls using many individual proxy to intercept HTTPS traffic. After designing and implementing our attacks in the BrackMe toolkit, we test them on different trackers, app and smartphones. We evaluated six Xiaomi fitness trackers, released from 2016 to 2021 and chronologically sorted in the table. From the older one, the Mi Band 2, to the most recent one, at the time, the Mi Band 6. Mi Band 4, 5 and 6 run pairing version 2, implement Bluetooth 5.0 and support both LE secure connections and link layer security. Those two security features are ignored by Xiaomi even though they would weaken some of our attacks without much impact on batteries on consumption. We evaluated the two Xiaomi official apps, ZLife and Zap. Both apps were rebranded very recently. Amazon Fit became ZLife after our first experiments in 2020, and Mi Fit became ZLife in 2022, months after our disclosure. We tested ZLife in 2020 and Zap in 2021 and notice that they share the same Xiaomi protocols and backend. Pairing with Zap Life will also show the newly paired tracker on Zap and vice versa. The rest of our setup is low cost and easy to reproduce, consisting of open source software and cheap hardware. A laptop running Ubuntu, a CSR BLE dongle for BLE address spoofing and a BLE sniffer. We deployed the four proximity and two remote attacks on the six most recent trackers and the two official apps. We confirm that ZapLife and Zap are vulnerable to the four attacks that interact with the app. Compared to Zap, ZapLife updates the firmware of the tracker to a more recent version, but is still vulnerable to all attacks. We also tested five Mi Bands and the Amazfit Core 2, which we identified as a Mi Band 3 clone. The fact that the trackers slightly differ from each other was not an issue. For example, when the Mi Band 6 was released, we updated the BrackMe toolkit and deployed all six attacks within one day. We confirm that all evaluated trackers are vulnerable to our attacks. The results of our evaluation clearly show that the security and privacy of the Xiaomi ecosystem are compromised, despite the guarantees made by Xiaomi. We also remind that our attacks are compliant with Xiaomi protocols, therefore they work on any app and tracker that support our versions of Xiaomi pairing authentication and communication, regardless of hardware and software details. This means that they would work on unofficial apps as well as BLE devices that are not fitness trackers, thus compromising the whole Xiaomi ecosystem. Statistical data updated to August 2022 show that our remote attacks work on at least 93% of Android devices as we test them on 600 versions. Most versions only need the standard Bluetooth and internet permissions. Instead, the newer Android 12 requires a stronger threat model because the malicious app needs the dangerous runtime permission Bluetooth Connect to speak with an already connected fitness tracker. While Android 12 alleviates the BLE API security issue, it does not affect in any way the Xiaomi vulnerabilities we highlighted that are still present and severe. We open source the BrackMe toolkit on GitHub. It contains SCAPI protocol dissectors able to identify and craft Xiaomi compliant packets. It reimplements the custom key derivation function during pairing and the challenge response during authentication. BrackMe can deploy all six presented attacks. You will find the video demonstration on the BrackMe YouTube channel, attacking Xiaomi and Fitbit devices. In the videos, I explain in few minutes how to perform BLE address spoofing, the different setups for Xiaomi and Fitbit, describe step by step the attacks on real fitness trackers and show how they affect the user. Our toolkit is an approved chess artifact. 
In conclusion, I present the results of our security assessment of the Xiaomi fitness tracking ecosystem. I highlight the security and privacy concerns raised by the presence of many severe and unknown vulnerabilities in Xiaomi's custom protocols, such as the unilateral and replayable authentication. In our paper, we discuss even more vulnerabilities, such as the unauthenticated pairing version 1, the ecosystem-wide default keeper, and the weak app authentication in pairing version 2, and more. I explained our six proximity and remote attacks, easily reproducible with BrackMe, an automated and extendable BLE security toolkit. In our paper, we will also find an in-depth analysis of Xiaomi's protocols, more information about our reverse engineering efforts, and the five state-of-the-art countermeasures that we propose to fix Xiaomi's protocol. Furthermore, we extended our analysis to the Fitbit ecosystem by targeting the Charles Chu tracker and discovered that, despite stronger security mechanisms, it is still vulnerable to five out of the six presented attacks. We encourage Xiaomi and other fitness tracking companies to provide better security and privacy for the users in the future releases of their proprietary protocols. Thank you. Okay, any question from the audience? Okay. Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned that you disclosed the vulnerabilities to Xiaomi. Um, can you say something about their um, answers? Did they? Uh, did you receive any answer? Uh, yes, we disclosed uh, all the vulnerabilities and our fixes. And uh, the answer was a cluster because uh, um, they just uh, dismissed them as a lack of encryption and we already know them. So uh, that was it. The follow-up from uh, Fitbit was from Google, which uh, owned the Fitbit, was a little bit better, uh, but it involved uh, all their devices. So they are still figuring it out if they want to deploy uh, fixes. Uh, the only other thing I can say is that uh, after the disclosure, after I, I think, the, uh, a few months, the new Bband uh, arrived and it uh, arrived a new firmware version. And this implemented at least some of uh, the fixes we suge suggested, which I don't, I'm not saying that it's uh, our, uh, um, it was our, um, they were motivated by ours, but uh, we are happy that uh, they are taking care of at least uh, some. Uh, vulnerabilities, but we didn't uh, perform a full evaluation. So that's the current state uh, of Mi Band that we know of. Okay, thank you. I recommend to keep the next question if you have to, um, probably offline through email um, to Marco. And we move to the next uh, or last um, talk of the session. Thank you, Marco. Thank Let's you. Thank you, Miguel. Okay, we are going to start the last talk of the session. Um, okay, the setup is ready. Almost. Good. The, the paper is titled and um, you're gone. Okay. Can you go to the first? <laughs> an energy and area efficient all digital entropy source compatible with modern standards based on GTER pipelining. And now we have um, Adrian now to give the talk. Okay. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So in this talk, I will introduce you to our uh, true random number generator design, which was fabricated in a 28 nanometer technology and which should be compatible to modern standards. Um, so first let's start with a quick introduction to random numbers. So probably most of you are aware by the fact that random numbers are heavily used in cryptography, but also in other domains like, for example, statistical simulations or online games and gambling, uh, random numbers are used. Uh, the, circuit I will show you here is um, mostly focused on the use in cryptography. So how to generate random numbers? 
Uh, in essence, there are two ways of generating random numbers. So on the left, you see uh, what we call a pseudo random number generator. So this is a deterministic device that given a certain protocol and a seed input will generate a stream of random uh, looking uh, digits. Um, it's important to know that everyone who has the same seed and the same protocol will generate the same uh, output. So no fresh entropy is being generated here. On the right hand, we have what we call a true random number generator. So this is an electronic device that based on some noise source, mostly electrical noise in integrated circuits, will try to, um, try to capture entropy from it and generate a random bit stream. So the device that I will show you later is of this second type. So if you've built your entropy source, how can you make sure that it's actually working properly because the output is random, you cannot just uh, test it. Um, so what people tend to do in the past was generate a large amount of random bits. Then it, they applied all sorts of test statistical tests to them. And then the test would indicate if there was some evidence that the, that the bits were not generated by a uniform random number generator. Um, if this was the case, then the designer tend to fine tune some parameters in the entropy source until the test indicated that the, the, the bits could be produced by a true random number generator. Um, there are some issues with this approach. And the main issue is that these tests will treat the entropy source as a black box. So the tests are actually not able to distinguish between uh, fresh entropy being generated or a pseudo random process uh, producing random bits or a combination of both. So these tests cannot differentiate between this. And it, it has been shown that a well-designed pseudo random number generator is actually capable of passing uh, several statistical tests. So that's why people moved on to a more modern approach. Um, and this approach is centered around the existence of a stochastic model. So a stochastic model is a mathematical description of how entropy is being captured from a noise source and transferred to an output bit stream. This model uh, is based on three inputs, an entropy requirement. This can come from a standard or from an application. Uh, some assumptions like, for example, the existence of certain type of noise sources and platform parameters, uh, which should be experimentally verified, like for example, the intrinsic gate delay in a certain technology. Then the stochastic model allows you to make, um, to um, determine um, your certain design parameters of your entropy source. And the stochastic model will also allow you to make an entropy estimate of the output. What you will do then is configure your entropy source and then at the end run some tests to check if the bits being produced uh, meet this entropy claim uh, uh, by the model. So um, this is the device that I will present you in this talk. Um, so it actually consists out of three parts. On the left, you have the delay chain. So these are two chains of inverters and we apply a, an, an edge uh, to, this, to the start of this chain. So out of, these, of both chains comes uh, two different edges. Uh, because of um, random jitter uh, always present in these, in these inverters, both edges will have some slightly random variations in the exact timing on when they come at the output. And this difference in random timing is what we try to capture in the time to digital converter, which is the middle block in uh, the circuit. So this is based on um, the fact that two ring oscillators are running independently and freely. And um, so the phases will start with some initial phase difference. And after a while, because the frequencies of both ring oscillators are slightly different, these phases will tend to synchronize. And this synchronization is uh, detected by the digitization. And then the digitization will capture the length of this synchronization um, as a random bit. Uh, it will produce a random bit from this. We did several things to optimize um, this architecture for throughput. So the first thing we did was trying to get the resolution at which we are capturing the random timing difference produced by the delay chains to get this resolution as small as possible. Because if you have good resolution, you don't need large accumulation times to accumulate enough timing jitter uh, before you can actually start measuring it. So this was done by doing precise frequency matching of the two ring oscillators in the middle block. Um, another thing we noticed is that um, as the bit is being, uh, being processed by the delay chain and then handled over to the time to digital converter, 
the delay chain is not doing anything at all. So we could already start the next bit. So in essence, what we are doing here is creating a jitter pipeline where two bits are being processed or accumulating jitter uh, at the same time. Um, this opened up an all new world of optimization because we now have to make sure that the pipeline is balanced as well. Um, for example, this is a timing diagram where I show this pipelining principle. So at the top, you can see we apply a starting edge, then what comes out of the both delay chains are two different edges, and this will trigger the start of the TDC ring oscillators. And when the TDC ring oscillators are still running, um, we already apply a new starting edge, and the second bit is being processed. Um, then the main part of our, of our paper consists of the, of the stochastic model for this device. So this is a high-level overview of this model. For the mathematical, mathematical details, I have to refer uh, to the paper. So I'll try to explain it. So we apply a starting edge in green. And then what comes out of these two delay chains are two edges in blue and red. Uh, these edges will have some slight variations on them, which are indicated by the uh, light blue uh, distributions T0 and T1. Uh, because the time to digital converter only looks at timing difference, we are also only interested in timing uh, difference, which is indicated by this T delta distribution. Um, this timing difference will then um, de determine the initial phase difference of these free running ring oscillators in the time to digital converter. And these, this phase different difference will tend, uh, will, will start to drift towards some threshold which indicates synchronization of the phases. And this is indicated by these noisy orange curves. And the time it takes for this curve to hit this uh, threshold is what we call the synchronization time or uh, which is indicated by the t pi uh, distribution on top. And then what the digitization does is digitizing this uh, distribution into a discrete random variable r. And then the parity of this random variable is what will be your output uh, bit. Um, so the entropy estimate made by the model is highly dependent on a certain platform parameter, which we call jitter strength. So jitter strength is the the ratio of uh, the amount of variance you accumulate, um, the uh, amount of variance of your timing difference, of your timing you accumulate uh, compared to the uh, overall period length of a certain oscillator. Uh, so we try to measure or estimate this uh, parameter by reusing the TRNG the TRNG circuitry we already had on the ASIC design. So on the left, you can see both delay change which are reused and on the bottom right you can see one TDC ring oscillator used. So what we did was we configured the top red uh, delay chain to have a very long delay and the bottom blue one to have a very short delay. So the time in between that the bottom one generates an edge and the top one generates an edge, we, get, we let this TDC ring oscillator run and we count how many cycles it takes before the top one produces its output. And because of the random uh, variations in this delay, the counter output will also be random. And based on this counter output, we work back what was the, um, the jitter strength. So two important notes on this. Um, this measurement is done differentially because we use two um, delay chains and we only measure the difference. And all measurements were performed on chip. All this is done to minimize influence of external noise sources. Uh, we try to be as conservative as possible because um, the worst thing you could do is overestimating the available jitter strength, which would lead to an overestimation of the available entropy density, which in turn would lead to a false security claim. So the measurement were performed on five devices. And as you could see, we took the most conservative one, uh, which resulted in a jitter strength of 30 femtoseconds. Um, then we still have four three parameters we could choose, which are the periods of these four ring oscillators you can see. So two in the delay chains, so which is actually the total delay of one uh, delay chain, and the periods of the TDC ring oscillators. There are three constraints that uh, restrict our, our choice of these parameters, namely the pipeline balance. As I explained earlier, both stages of the pipeline should have approximately equal delay. Then there is an entropy density constraint because we want to have a sufficient amount of entropy at the output and the throughput because at the end, if we still have some freedom, we want to maximize for throughput. 
Um, so these constraints are, are visualized in the figure on top. So on the vertical axis, you will see a resolution of the, uh, of the time to digital converter. And on the horizontal axis, you will see accumulation time. So the entropy density constraint is indicated by the blue curve on top, which means that your, uh, it, 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 it will produce an upper bound on your resolution. Because if you want to have enough entropy, you need to have a certain precision uh, for a certain accumulation time to be able to measure uh, the jitter. If your resolution is too uh, large, you will just miss uh, the jitter. The pipeline balance constraint, on the other hand, will produce a lower bound on your resolution. Because if the resolution is too small, it will take too long for the ring oscillators to synchronize. And the TDC stage will be uh, much larger in delay than the first stage. So your pipeline is unbalanced. So your resolution should be somewhere in between the blue and the red curve, which is indicated by the purple uh, gradient. And of course, as uh, throughput is inversely proportional to accumulation time, we want to have a small accumulation time as possible, which is more to the left of the graph. So in, in theory, the optimal point would be at the intersection of both curves. But as we want to have a robust architecture, we want to have some margin away from the boundaries. So we end up with an optimal uh, region. It's also interesting to look how the position of these bounds is determined. Uh, the entropy density constraint, the blue one on top, is mainly determined by the jitter strength parameter we measured uh, earlier. So the higher this parameter will tend, I uh, will make this blue curve uh, shift upward. Um, the pipeline balancing constraint, the red one on bottom, is highly influenced by the maximum oscillation speed of the TDC ring oscillator. So the higher ring oscillator speed we could achieve, uh, the lower this curve would be and the higher our throughput would be. Um, so then the experimental results. So as uh, mentioned earlier, we this, this device was fabricated in a 28 nanometer CMOS technology. Uh, we measured out five devices. Uh, the first thing we checked was the IID uh, claim, because we claim the, bit, the output bits are uh, independent and identically distributed, because in theory, there is no state being transferred from one bit, bit generation to another. Um, so we generated uh, consecutive counter outputs um, and checked for correlation. No evidence of correlation was found. And the second thing we did was we applied the NIST SP890B IID tests. And again, no uh, evidence of dependency was found. Uh, we also validated, validated the entropy. And we observed that all five devices tested were able to achieve the minimal, minimally required 0.91 bit entropy density at the output. Um, at the end, we also checked for throughput and power. So we observed that all devices uh, were able to produce a throughput of higher than 250 megabits per second, which is uh, the highest reported so far for jitter-based uh, TRNGs. Um, the output minimum entropy was always above the 0 0.91 threshold for all uh, voltage levels, both under and over voltage uh, levels tested. And we achieved the best energy efficiency of 1.46 picojoules per bit, which is highest um, energy, uh, be lowest energy efficiency, uh, best energy efficiency, but lowest energy uh, reported so far. Um, so to conclude, uh, we presented here a entropy source architecture design and verification method, uh, which was fabricated in a 28 nanometer technology. Uh, the design is compatible with modern standards. Uh, the jitter pipelining architecture should allow for um, efficient entropy generation, both in terms of area and energy usage. Um, the structure is all digital, which means it will benefit from further scaling and uh, would, uh, would, would make it easy to integrate uh, with other digital components. There is also a stochastic model available, which is capable of, gen of uh, creating an entropy estimate. We have on-chip jitter measurements, and we have an optimization scheme which should guide the desi designer uh, to, for parameter selection. Thank you. Any question? Okay, there is a question online that did you check bias, correlation and channel entropy um, I'm not sure actually, AIS31 bounds with much more samples like 2 to the 30. 
instead of just using 4,000 values? Yeah, so, um, for, so yeah, uh, we checked for entropy because yeah, he asked for Shannon entropy, but yeah, we always report that min entropy, but there is a one-to-one -one relation between this. Um, and yeah, these things are, are related to bias and entropy. So these are also fine. Um, then there was a question about the amount of data we use. So maybe there is a confusion. So the only the IID test, the correlation test was performed with 4,096 counter values. The other ones were all um, performed with more than one, uh, at least one megabit of consecutively generated bits. Okay, thank you. There is a question there. Thanks a lot for an interesting talk. Um, how in, um, difficult would it be to transfer this to a different uh, technology node, do you think? I guess it's fairly easy to do this because it's fully digital design. Um, all the, the, the blocks here are just regular CMOS logic. So I guess there is not much effort to transfer this. Of course, you still need to fine tune the parameters a bit because the intrinsic gate delays might be slightly different, but the effort should be fairly low, uh, especially compared to other TNG designs. Okay, for the last question, I have to run again. <clears throat> oh, fast. Oh, hold. <laughs> Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you had considered um, fault attacks at all and how it might impact the circuit. For now, we didn't uh, do anything of that kind of work but that would be an interesting future work of course, but for now, yeah, intuitively I would say because the, the architecture is fully differential. So if you, for example, play with power lines, the effects would be somewhat reduced, but still it's hard to tell at this moment. Well, I look forward to hearing your future investigations. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, let's thank all the speakers of the session. Before you leave, there is something from Benedict. Yes. So please, please stay in the room for one minute. Let the yellow shirts guys first get into their positions to guide you out. We have been informed that the 900 students that were in the other auditorium have left the building and coffee is ready. So just you guys distribute, please. And then they guide you back to the coffee break. Thank you.